and says, hey, the caller can decide what to do when there's success. And the caller can decide what to do if there's failure, right? So we're going to create an email address function that accepts a success and a failure um, function, functions, and also the email. And then here, um, we'll just call it with the email address if it's success. Otherwise, we're going to create, pass some string into the failure method. So that kind of defines, here's the signature of our, you know, failure methods. Success and failure method, and here's how we might use this. And what what I show here is um, partial function application. All right. So if you have various places in your code where you're creating email addresses, it would be kind of really. And you always want to do the same success and failure method. It really kind of suck to kind of have to pass that in in all those places, right? So you can do what's called partial application, and you can create a new function, basically seeding our create email address three with our six standard success and failure methods. But if any one case in your application you need to override that, they still could by calling the original function. Um, and then so we can call it like this, right? So this, that would be bad, and that would be good. Hey, Mark. Yes. Make that a little easier to, to, to see. Could you, could you rename your, your first two functions to be my success and my failure? Oh. Yes, so that's we're what I do. Use them with uh, parameters. Oh, not there. Not <laughs> there. Not there. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah. Down, no, not there either. Wait. Yeah. Richard, what'd you do? Don't go down. You were passing that in. Yes. Yeah, leave, leave the function as, leave the higher function the same. Just change it. Got it. Yeah. Now, now we can tell that yes. these two functions that you defined outside of that function are the ones that it's going to execute when there's a success or a failure. Right. And those functions could be anything as well. So what I didn't do, because it got kind of complex, so I just wanted to kind of show that um, you, you could take this um, you can wrap your single case union into a module, okay? I'm just going to show you and talk through it. It will be easier because this is a, this is kind of where the real value of this is. So, and then it's this. So making illegal states unrepresentable. Sorry, I apologize. Oh, here we go. Sorry. So, so what I created in my script was just kind of a loose function for creating an email address, right? So it'd be nice if we kind of put that together with the creation of our email address type that we had, right? So the way, the way he went through here was he created a, a module called the same thing as a type, and then he kind of hid, hid the email address in here, inside, right? So here's the create method that kind of wraps it that we saw, right? So this is what I stole here. And then, so there is a create method and a value method inside of this email address module. And then down here, it shows how you might use that. 
right? So you say email address dot create whatever, right? And then here's how you would use a value from it. So here, you know, so this looks like object oriented kind of, right? I mean, because you got encapsulation, and I think I don't know if there's a misconception or not that you know because it's a functional language, there's no encapsulation. Actually, there's quite a bit of encapsulation because you you can create function scope, right? And you can actually hide, um, you know, dangerous things in, inside, you know, dangerous operations. So, like, if you have to mutate stuff sometimes, right? You have to have side effects in your application. The application would probably be boring if they didn't have side effects. So, but what you don't want to do is you don't want, you want to do that in a controlled way, right? So you can take a function and inside that you can say, all right, I'm going to be able to mutate this piece of data, but only I can do it through this, um, only, you can only do that through this function and I get to control how that is, you know, nobody else does. So that, in, in that fashion, in terms of safety and kind of the goals of encapsulation and protecting data, I think functional languages actually have, I don't know, I think more to offer than object-oriented languages, in my opinion. I don't, I'm going to have to back that up somehow, <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> So anyway, so this is this is actually a really interesting article that makes a makes a lot of use out of single case unions, and you can see how they're used in pattern matching and other stuff, and how you could design a system with all kinds of validation stuff baked into very specific types, and you end up on the end of it all, you end up with code that makes a lot of sense. You don't have first name string, last name string. You got first name is a first name, last name is a last name, and that type has very specific behaviors that actually doesn't even let you create an email address unless it's valid, right? So you can't have this bad data running around. And if you're using a functional language, like uh, you have to use the return values and stuff, right? So you don't have to use them, but as you're programming, the compiler is going to tell you, hey, you're not using the return value of this thing. You need to do something with it, either discard it or use it. And so that's going to make you pause and think, oh yeah, I guess I do have to deal with this thing, right? So I, and that's something that I think F sharp brings to the table, and, and discriminating unions are a really big part of how that works. Really check this article out, this whole thing. It looks daunting, but it's just a lot of code to you, to, you know, once you get the hang of what he's trying to do. You get through it. Anyway, a lot of props to him. So anyway, I don't have anything more. <laughs> That was a lot. Was that long? No. Uh, questions, feedback, comments? Can I look at something? So, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a comment. Um, this isn't strictly functional, but um, discriminated unions are actually full-fledged types. So, although it wasn't illustrated here with these examples, in the most common case, or the most common way to use discriminated unions in functional programming, is basically to represent data structures. Uh, you can give them behavior, right? They, you can you oh, can give yeah, them members absolutely. and you all sure that can. kind of stuff. So sure. that, that's well, a great well, point. Though. No, I mean, yeah. discriminated. You, you cannot attach a function to a discriminated union or a method to a discriminated union the way you would to a class. No, you cannot. Um, you you can create classes. You can create normal .NET classes in, in F sharp and do with them all that you. Do with a class in C sharp, um, but really the, 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 the purpose of a discriminated union is, is not to find the data representation to the functionality. Um, it's just the opposite. You want the data and the functionality to be able to develop independently of each other. Um, uh, well, correct that. You want you want the functionality to be able to develop independently of the data. Um, Data changes. I mean, you add cases to your union, or you change the the contents of some case. Then all the functions that deal with that union are, are going to have to be modified to comply with it. Um, but you can add functions willy nilly and anywhere you like, any place in any of your code, no matter what module or what assembly you define the discriminated union in. Any F sharp that can see the definition of that type can can add more functions to handle that. So that's really the, um, a, a, a point that's been made before about, about this in, in, in F Sharp and other languages, other similar functional languages that have this, is that the thing that, 
the thing you can, in, in, a, in a class hierarchy, inheritance, the thing that stays the same from all, amongst all the types that are in the hierarchy is the behavior of the methods. Okay, you define what methods there are on a base class. Every single class that inherits from or derives from that base class must carry all those methods. They can override the implementation or not, depending on how you write the subclasses and whether the methods are virtual or not. But they're always going to have those methods. On the other hand, they're free to change the data however they want. They can, you know, if they totally encapsulate the data so it's not even visible outside, then every subclass can represent its own data internally any way it wants. Hmm. Okay, so data is, is the part that's open when you're doing hierarchies in, 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 in object oriented programming. Okay, functionality is the part, or methods are the part that's closed. Mm -hmm. And it's the opposite with discriminated unions. The data is exposed, it's closed. Functionality is open. You can add as much functionality anywhere or, or, or as little anywhere you want. So, yeah, you can't add members of, like, to a discriminated union, and I don't know if it's really, I don't know it's, how much it's used in practice. Well, I just said you couldn't. Huh? You're making me look dumb. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but you, you can. You, you can do this. Sorry, right, so, so. It's probably just not the, the traditional functional style, though, right? And it's not. Yeah, yeah, and I, if you I look at that, it's, it's, Richard was saying, if right? you look at that, it's, it's, it's not terribly different than if you define that, that function outside of it. Exactly, and I think that's the point. So instead of it's data, you know, data versus and like program flow, do you want to carry the functionality with your type, or do you want it to kind of be more open, kind of like what Richard was saying? Right. So I mean, this kind of locks it, locks it, the usage of this function, right? I mean, it doesn't. That's not a very general purpose kind of place to put a function like that. But that, yeah, that definitely works. Um, and, uh, it wouldn't have even occurred to me to, to wonder if you could do that. Yes, yeah. I mean, but my only point was it's, it's there, but it's not idiomatic for the functional style to do that kind of thing. So, you know. No. And um, you, can, you can accomplish the, the same thing just by putting the type and all in that yeah. function in the same module. And, you know, module is a unit of um, uh, exposure. Uh, anything that's visible. From uh, you know, from inside that module, is, you know, if anything is, then uh, everything is. Yeah. That's a great point because you can mm -hmm. definitely do that, but yeah, in practice, I don't know if it's used or if it's idiomatic. Right. Any honest opinions about? I mean, is this? Uh, Compelling I think, reason. I think it changes to, to, the way we look at the world. I mean, like, to step back and get a little more grandiose about it. I mean, we, many of us have been taught or, or learned over many, many years now that when you analyze the problem, you know, the, strictly in non-programming terms, you, you, your client tells you what his problem is, or you know, you, you crack open a book and you read about it, or whatever. However, you learn about the problem space. You start thinking in terms, as soon as you start thinking about how would I write an application for this, you, you think in terms of classes. Where are the classes? What are, or, or, or you think in terms of objects. What are the objects involved here? Um, and whole books are written about how you do, how you go about doing this. Um, you, and you can do that with F sharp. You can write classes and write inheritance and interfaces and the whole thing uh, and do it that way. Or you can do it this way, and you can start with, instead of saying, where are my classes, you can say, where are my discriminated unions? Um, you know, and, and, and think about more about the data, and what, what kinds of data must go together. Uh, what, you know, how, how would I represent the dimensions of my problem in terms of things that belong together and ought to be treated together? Because that's, that's really what this kind of data type can do powerfully for you is force you to always deal with all these things at the same time, even though they may not have anything in common in terms of how they're structured. Um, so uh, that's, as, as, I think as, as, as we as programmers and as the, the functional programming community gets more experience, I think you'll hear more and more talking about functional 
object-oriented design as a, an alternative to object-oriented design, um, and, and people get a little more sophisticated. That I mean, a lot of functional programming study, let's face it, is very academic. It's very mathematical. It's very theoretical. It's not. You know, it, you know, it hasn't been done that much in the hands-on world compared to object-oriented, but it's getting there. I think there'll be more perspective on this uh, in a few years. You know, object object oriented programming is all academic too. Uh, in, in the very beginning, uh, so I think this is a, this is a, a step that that we can take that will uh, make functional programming uh, more more mainstream. As we start saying, here's 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 how you can approach problems from the very beginning, from, from the moment when you first start to think about it, um, to get to a functional type. Of so, so one, one of the frustrations that I had with object-oriented programming, and it really wasn't clear to me until I started learning functional programming, was that whenever I was designing a, an object-oriented system, I had something to do, right? I spent more time worrying about where the code is going to be, what's the object going to be called, what method is it going to, what's the method name going to be, what parameters should it accept, and all this kind of stuff that had nothing to do with the algorithm, the problem that I want to solve. F sharp has totally changed that for me, right? So I get to focus on, hey, I got this thing that I wanted to do, and I can just start writing a function, and I can do it. And I can do that in object-oriented programming, right? But it's not nearly as natural. And then I got to worry about, it's still at the end of the day, when I get my algorithm right, I got to figure out, okay, well, what object does this live in? And I always feel like I make the wrong choice, right? And I always feel like I'm a bad programmer because I didn't do it properly, right, according to all the books. And then so this is, this is so much more natural feeling to me because um, I just have a program flow and I need something to happen at a particular point in time and I can just analyze some data as it's coming through the pipeline of stuff and if I need to create new functions out of existing functions I can do that and it's just a lot more malleable to me and I don't have to worry about this other kind of object interaction stuff that you have to worry about in OO images. <laughs> yeah, come on, more. I mean, yeah, we need I more mean, it's like what he's saying. I mean, if it, if it becomes uh, mainstream, then there's going to be a whole lot of opinions about where stuff should go and how you're doing it, and then you'll be a bad programmer again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we won't be able to feel so elitist. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'd love to hear challenge. I mean, challenges to some of these things that we're saying. I mean, it sounds like we're bashing languages. Not really, I just want